All right, good morning, everybody. We'll uh, go ahead and get started. Um, so everybody, my name is Jason Collier. I work at Microsoft. Um, I live in Redmond, Washington. So I made this short trip out here, so I appreciate uh, the, the invite I got and a uh, little jet lag, so bear with me. Um, I'm a senior customer engineering architect, so pretty long, fancy title. Um, I work in the product group, and so I work with customers that are deploying our cloud solutions. So Skype for Business Online, primarily voice deployments, so PSTN calling, PSTN conferencing. Prior to that, I worked on the beta team. So the beta team had about 13 engineers working for me. Um, I used to be customer focused, customer facing on the road, um, and then ran the beta team for about 15 months and kind of missed being on the road on and seeing customers. Um, it's been a bit of a challenge now because I've been on the road for I think 10 weeks straight, so um, be careful what you wish for, right? Um, so a lot of what we're gonna talk about here is experiences from the beta team as well as working prior to beta in support. Um, I was also a field engineer. Um, anybody here amazing at troubleshooting? Yeah, me either. Right, so it, it's a science, right? You know, sometimes you'll go into it and you'll say, I know exactly what I'm gonna do and you focus all your attention here and then you look over to the left and you find the problem was something you didn't even touch or didn't even focus on. Um, so I'll kind of share lessons learned, things like that. Now the one thing I'll say is if you've never, I'm gonna mess up the grammar, troubleshot, troubleshooted something, um, if you've never worked in troubleshooting or, tr or in support, you're not gonna walk out of here able to go diagnose any and every Skype for Business issue. Um, so we'll kind of give you, I'll give you the pointers, things to look for. Um, I've got the agenda up here. I kind of do things dynamically. So if we go off agenda, don't worry. Um, if you have questions, feel free to, to fire them off. Um, I'll repeat the questions so you don't have to worry about the microphone. Um, so we'll talk about a method to the madness. So there's always, you have to approach problem solving with a plan, right? Um, Anybody work in deployments? Do you ever deploy an infrastructure without a plan? Sometimes, right? Which is good, because that's why I have a job. No, I'm kidding, I digress. Um, so we'll talk about the desktop client. We'll talk about PSTN calling and PSTN conferencing in online. Um, we're not gonna talk a ton about troubleshooting on-premises server. Um, pretty much it hasn't changed for, I think LCS 2005, so been pretty stagnant for about eight years, 10 years on how to troubleshoot server. Um, we've evolved things like the logging and things like that. Um, anybody using the Skype for Business for Mac client in here? One, two, three, do you know me? I, I supported the Mac client, so if you opened a bug on the Skype for Business for Mac client, um, you probably worked with me on that. Um, I will talk about that. Um, since we're all amazing best friends, I may tell you information that's not yet public, so please keep that between us. As I watch Twitter and everything else light up, Jason says, the Mac client. Um, we'll talk about mobility, so pretty much mobile phones, everybody has them. Um, and so uh, we'll talk about mobility. Um, anybody have a Windows phone in here? Oh my gosh, wow. You guys are great. Um, so we'll talk about mobility, um, everything iPhone, Android, Windows Phone. Um, pretty much for me, any device is the same, and we'll talk about that. Um, so what this is not, it's not a debugging session. I'm not gonna go take the Skype for Business client, crash it, attach a debugger, step through code, because that's boring and not interesting, in my opinion. Things you need to know in the Skype for Business world. Um, so SIP. Obviously, um, anytime I interview a candidate, there's two questions I, inter I interview. I'm the quickest interview. I ask like two questions, five minutes, I can hire a candidate or not. Um, first is SIP, and I always throw it out there. Tell me what you know about SIP. You know, quickest way to find out what somebody knows is, you know, don't even give them a leading question. So you need to know the basics of SIP. When the, I talk about the basics of SIP, what I really mean is status codes, HTTP status codes, you know, do a 200, is that an okay, 404, things like that. So SIP status messages um, are very um, important to understand, right? When we're looking at a log, if you don't know what a 200 okay is, then you're kind of gonna get stuck. Anybody in here use Fiddler? Good. 
everybody should use Fiddler, especially as we in Skype evolve. Fiddler will become more crucial and critical for all the products. Um, anybody a Mac user only? So Charles is a Fiddler equivalent on the Mac. Um, if you have Mac users in your organization, you may want to investigate that. Um, anybody support Mac users? It's the CEO, CIO, and everybody that's very, very, very important, right? Awesome. So Microsoft was super cool to you guys. We made the link for Mac client. It was kind of, you know, not the best client out there. Um, so we've definitely improved that. We'll talk about the Mac client. Um, so when we talk a method to the madness, um, it's a random approach. This always works, right? Um, I forget who we were talking to. Oh, there was a, I was in the speaker room yesterday and this guy showed up and he's got a SQL demo and he's got it on like a Raspberry Pi. You know, it boots up and he's got like wires everywhere and I'm like, you flew with that? That's great. You know, they took my cologne and you brought a Raspberry Pi with like eight different cables. Um, and it didn't work, right? And so I joked with him, I was like, you try turning it off and on again, right? But so method to the madness. Um, you know, so one of the things Microsoft support was bad at, in my opinion, previously, is we would say, well, have you tried a different network, right? We would always fall back to the network, and we didn't really go towards structured troubleshooting. Um, so it's all about asking the right questions. Um, so one of the things I love, um, my girlfriend is not the most technically um, capable person, so she'll say, my computer has an error. Cool, thanks for sharing, you know. <laughs> Cool story, let's talk again. Um, so I have to ask her the right questions, right? So she doesn't really know what to say. Typically your end users are those folks, right? They're not out there saying, hey, I got this HTTP status code 404, it said file not found, here's the web server it was pointing to. And oh, by the way, I can't resolve anything else when it, any other browsers. If you have that end user, please send them to me because I would love to work with them. Um, so determine the potential components, right? So. I, I'm very big on analogies, which annoys everybody, but it's always troubleshooting, peeling back the layers of the onion and finding the problem. And you know, quite often you'll spend the time looking in the wrong area. So, um, so key questions: the when, where, why, how, who. You know, questions. So, what happened? Um, I have a customer yesterday tells me, "Hey, I had a PSTN conferencing issue." So I called the um, product owner and I was like, hey, did we have a PSTN conferencing outage? And they were like, nope. So then I called the customer back and I said, when did this happen? They were like, nine weeks ago? <laughs> Great, cool. So I've been on travel, I get it. So, um, so when did it happen? Where did it happen? Who was affected? Um, anybody using PSTN conferencing and Skype for Business Online? Sheesh, all right. We need more hands, so maybe next year you guys can all raise them up. So who's affected? PSTN users, VoIP users, you know, the client users, or both, right? That's key to know. And then error message or symptom. Um, so my girlfriend would be up there, she can't place calls, right? But we really want the customer to say, hey, you know, I got a message that says this call could not be completed. I was, you know, attempting to call the Redmond office, here's the phone number I was doing. Now, one of the things I always do with my customers is, um, who here loves getting calls from end users? It's weird, everybody's arms hurt, right? <laughs> um, I always prop up the help desk with troubleshooting guides, questions to ask. Um, and I'm gonna share something that we're tentatively gonna release, so um, I'll share it. If it doesn't happen, Vox Tang told you. If it happens and everybody loves it, Jason. Um, so I work on something called Skype Operations Framework. Anybody heard of that? Okay, I wish you more. So write this down mentally, skypeoperationsframework.com. We in the product group found customers were challenged with deployments and we created a framework, a methodology on how to deploy PSTN conferencing, PSTN calling, and all of our solutions. One of the things we're putting in there is troubleshooter. Basically asking the right questions in a kind of call flow or a, a, a logical flow to get to the cause or to the resolution to a problem. What we're publishing is what we use in support. So how awesome would that be to not have to pick up the phone, dial you know, 1-800-MICROSOFT-HELP-ME or go online and open a ticket. So that's our goal. I'm fairly confident we'll do that. So definitely check out Skype Operations Framework. 
So when uh, we look at an outage, right? So um, iPad users before Microsoft call me and say, you know, hey, Skype for Business or at the time was Communicator can't sign in. I'm like, okay, you know, are you having PC issues? 10 minutes into the call, they'll say, yeah, and you know what? Everybody else in the building can't sign in either. Um, so we want to classify the issue. Is it a wide area network outage? Is it a faulty device? Um, congestion. I had a great government customer who had voice issues. And after a few minutes on the phone, they were like, yeah, anytime I'm watching Netflix, the desktop sharing goes down. I'm like, huh, weird. And if you pause it, what happens? She's like, oh, it gets tons better. I'm like, cool. So can we just not watch Netflix at work? Um, quality of service settings and then wireless. So wireless has always been kind of our Achilles heel. Um, we don't do good with packet loss on a lot of things, right? So I'm gonna talk about some new things we've introduced to a deal with that. Configuration issues, um, unplanned outages. Um, I had a client where the uh, UC architects reset quorum in the middle of the day on the pool. And they were like, this shouldn't be end user impacting. Like, yeah, I mean, you just took every front end down. I don't see why there was an issue. So client, incorrect settings, local connectivity, application issues, driver issues. This one is a, a, has got me vexed lately. So we have some issues with HP EliteBook Realtek drivers where they cause mid-call failures on a call that's been going on for something like two hours and 26 minutes, right? So trust me, that was fun for us to identify. Um, cached information, and then obviously third-party application conflicts. There's tons of add-ons for Skype for Business and Link, and sometimes those can be problematic and play havoc with us. Um, so one of the ways that I've learned the product and the Mac users back there, we got the Mac client, God, it was 15 months ago, 14 months ago, and it was given to us, we can install it, and you know, when I was in beta, we didn't have any documentation. How does this work, any specs or anything like that? So what we had to do was reverse engineer it. And what we would do is install the client, look at the logs. Sign in, look at the logs. Send an IM to Vaktang, look at the logs, right? You know, do a call. And you really learn how the client works or how the server works. Um, one of the things I do, I always take a, so you know, you call me and you say, I'm trying to, what's a good one? Do desktop sharing with the Mac client and I, it's failing. So you give me the logs, I go do desktop sharing with the Mac client on mine. I reproduce the scenario exactly. Two monitors, side by side. Okay, everything looks good. Oh gosh, his logs just went off the rails here. Here's what happens. Um, so the other thing, um, I wish this customer was here because they were in Atlanta. So I was working an issue with a customer where um, mediation server can place outbound calls. And so we're on the phone, right? Desktop share going on. And he's like, oh, let me change the mediation server port. Let me restart the edge. Let me do this, right? And he's like 12 things going on. And RDP, right? We have that lag where I'm like, whoa, wait, wait, don't change that. He's like, oh, I already changed it. Hold on. Oh, he's like, yeah, I restarted the service. I'm like, sheesh, you know, one change at a time. So do phased and controlled changes. I know that sounds like common sense, um, but it happens more often where I'm watching somebody do something and they're like, change 20 things, they reboot, and now they've got a totally different experience. I'm like, cool, you know, now we've got a rescope, which is big at Microsoft, right? Anybody had that where an engineer has told you scope change? We need to know the scope of what we're working on to be able to fix it. So apply the fix. Um, anybody here have blogs? Any MVPs, masters? So one of the things I always do, I work at Microsoft, right? And if I get an error message, I go to my favorite search engine, right, which would be, <laughs> where's my Windows phone users? You're using Bing, I know it, come on. Um, so go out to your search engine, search the error message. You know, document what you're changing. Um, I have the worst memory, so I have a OneNote, and I'm making notes of what I'm doing, right? Because, you know, I go to lunch, Vaktang buys me a glass of wine, we go back and when it's fixed, I'm like, cool, what did we do, right? So document what you're doing, and then share. Share what you're doing with everybody. Anybody aware of video-based screen sharing? Yikes, all right. Well, everybody's gonna raise their hand at the end of this. Anybody aware of offline messaging? So we introduced this feature, we didn't tell anybody about it, 
and then all of a sudden you would get an email saying, hey, you missed a message, right? And the message would be in there. Um, savvy end users would notice at the bottom, hey, this user's offline, send them a message, they'll receive it. Um, so we introduced these two features recently, last nine months maybe, six months? Six months. Um, I'll talk about both of them um, here at length. Um, so both are two entirely different features, but have similarities in how we troubleshoot them. Um, so they share a kind of a commonality. So the client architecture, we use SIP for signaling. We communicate through the front ends. We do web services, HTTPS. That's where Fiddler comes in. Um, we talk to Exchange, right? So that's kind of important. Um, and then we do direct media or maybe we relay. Um, anybody seen Thomas Binder's Sun Churn Ice presentation? Best presentation out there. I have a link in here, by far the best. Go watch it and then fill out the survey and tell you how good my session was. <laughs> um, so when we look at these, the desktop client, we have two log files. One is the UCAPI logs, which are great. Um, anybody read this with Notepad? You guys are insane. No. Um, I use Notepad, text editor, Notepad++. We'll talk about a couple tools. I'm gonna give you one of the tools I use internally. Um, I'll give it away, so don't tell everybody. Um, ETL files, so this one, ETL files are great. Unfortunately, you guys can't parse them, so they're encoded, you can't see them. A lot of the times, if you open a support case, we're gonna ask for the ETL files, if it's not a SIP signaling issue. Event viewer. I found that a lot of customers don't look in the event logs, and we log a ton of stuff in the client to the event viewer, so start looking there. Um, this is great for the help desk because it's human readable. Um, you know, a SIP request failed, um, you know, information on it, things like that, so. So we'll talk about video-based screen sharing. So um, desktop sharing's been around for a while. Um, huge, valuable feature, I love it. It had some challenges, right? Is anybody in an engineering company uses AutoCAD, things like that? Anybody in here? Somebody raise their hand, box hand, box hand up. Um, so when we would share something that was very highly animated, you would get the tunk, 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 you know, it was tiling around, it wasn't a very fluid experience. So desktop sharing was TCP based, um, remote desktop protocol, eight frames per second and no hardware acceleration. So we introduced VBSS, which is video-based screen sharing. So it's essentially desktop sharing using the H.264 protocol. So basically desktop sharing as media or as a video stream. Um, so UDP or TCP, faster call setup. So one of the most annoying things, what happens when I'm on a conference call and somebody says, okay, I'm gonna share my desktop. What's the very next sentence out of their mouth? Let me know when you can see it. That's horrible, right? And that was because of RDP. It took forever to start up. It was like three, four seconds. You know, you're watching paint dry. As an engineer working at Microsoft, when a customer does that, I'm like, please, please work, please work. So that's why we introduced video-based screen sharing. Um, up to 30 frames per second. So with the dev, when we, were troubleshoot when we were piloting this, troubleshooting it, I would go to YouTube. I would fire up a YouTube video and then I would share my desktop, which is like the most intensive you can do is video in a desktop share. The devs hated it, but they made it work and they got it better. And you know, it's not as supported or what we recommend. You know, the Boxhang's like, please don't tell them to do that, but it will work that way. Um, we do fallback, so um, anybody in here very, very, very savvy with Wireshark? So you'll notice that when I'm doing a VBSS or video-based screen sharing, we still have some RDP signaling going on and that's for fallback. So. That's if an older client joins, um, or if you know, Voxhang requests control in a meeting, it'll fall back to RDP. Or if I enable meeting recording. Um, we have had some issues with video-based screen sharing. Um, we had a corner case with like Excel pivot tables causing VBSS to crash when using an HP Elite book on wireless. So one of my good friends who's an MVP posted a blog article on how to disable VBSS. Please don't. If you have VBSS issues, hold me, hold Microsoft accountable, get us to fix it, right? Because this is a huge benefit to you guys. So, um, I thought I skipped a slide. So, um, one of the big things with Snooper, everybody's using Snooper in here. So, there's a new build of Snooper coming out. 
don't share this, and you can share it. Um, should be a new build of Snooper coming out. Improved performance with the Android logs. Can read Mac logs directly in Snooper. Um, did you guys know you can read mobile logs in Snooper? Not many people knew this. Um, I <laughs> worked at Microsoft almost five years. I walked by somebody the other day and I was talking to him and they had Snooper open and I was like, what are you working on? He's like, oh, an iPhone issue. And I'm like, <laughs> why are you using Snooper? You can't open an iPhone logs. He's like, yeah, you can. So open your mobility logs with Snooper. I'm gonna give you something probably better than Snooper. Um, one of the things, anybody's got a multi-monitor set up, right? We're all computer geeks, right? So one of the things I do, I have Snooper open, I have Sublime open, I have uh, Notepad++ open. So I use three different tools usually, um, just in the toolkit. So um, what I'm looking at here is a call that I did with um, my buddy Ricardo. We've got a call ID over here. Call ID is a unique GUID or a unique ID for the call, so we can follow it through the logs. My, note, my notepad person back there for Snooper would copy that and then just do control find and find all messages. In Snooper, we can right click and just say, you know, find related messages. So remember I talked about the SIP 200 OK. So this is when we're getting confirmation or a success. Um, here we can see that I'm doing RDP in a call. I can see this candidate negotiation. Um, I'll talk a little bit about candidate negotiation, but Thomas Bender's session on ICE goes to candidate negotiation for about 45 minutes. Um, there's a video in the masters that is eight hours long on candidate negotiation. So um, hugely important topic. We'd probably waste the entire day, but. So things we can identify in here. So um, in a log, we can identify the call. We can identify the IP addresses used in the call. Um, you know, one of my favorite things is I work with customers and they'll say, huh, why is that IP there, right? So these are little key crucial things to look for. Um, candidates, you know, my IP address, what the network sees my IP address as, i.e. the edge through the Sunturn um, process, and then remote candidates. So I'm trying to send a file to Vakpeng, and I can see the IP address that we're seeing from him in those logs. So here's a SIP invite for a desktop sharing session. Um, you can see it's RDP only, um, and so you can see that there. Other things in there, so um, anybody know what the VQ report is inside of Snooper? So anybody ever troubleshoot, troubleshoot, troubleshooted, troubleshooted? Anybody ever worked on a call quality issue? VQ report is your best friend. That's like, I never remember how to find it in the logs. I just go search for VQ report. Um, everything we can see in there. So I can see everything about the call. Um, packet loss rate. Anybody have a network that has zero packet loss? Yeah, no network guys in here. Um, so packet loss is probably the biggest weakness for our product as far as call quality goes. Um, so we can check the protocols used. I can see the bit rate that was being sent. I can see you know the statistics or the media line statistics. Um, I added a slide in here. It's probably gonna be a little fuzzy because I screen capped it from my phone, but I'll show that here in a second. So um, I talked about video-based screen sharing, packet loss networks. Believe it or not, our customers' networks aren't the greatest. Um, Microsoft, we have a fairly robust network, but we're fairly challenged on running our own network. Right, we have lines of business that do their own things. We've got the media team, you know, Azure media team tries, you know, test something and they push out tons of video data over our network. So we had to work around that. And so what I wanna show you is RDP on a lossless network. So on the right side is Voktang doing a desktop share. On the left is me watching it, right? And I'm trying to help him and I'm like, okay, Voktang, now click there. And he's already 10 seconds, 15 seconds ahead of me. Um, so this is a very real world example, right? Anybody ever had this on a call? Sucks, right? It's horrible. Um, so don't worry, I fixed it. I didn't fix it, but the devs did. Um, so we'll let this finish. Um, I recorded this demo because A, I know the demo gods never smile upon me. Um, so I recorded this, I thought it was super cool. Fired this up at Atlanta and PowerPoint crashed. <laughs> I was like, awesome, you know, that was the first time. Um, so that's RDP on a lossless network. That's my favorite, the tiling. Anybody ever get that? 
And you're like, uh, there's mouse trails, there's ghost trails everywhere. All right, so that's RDP on a loss, a 10% packet loss network. Um, so how do we start the troubleshooting? So for that scenario, I cheated, right? I had a tool that we use internally that gener or generates packet loss on a network to generate congestion. But I can look inside that and I can compare for my known good. You know, Bak Peng sends me his logs. He had a horrible experience. I reproduce on my little isolated network. I have a perfect experience, right? So I can compare those logs and I could say, you know, I had jitter, right? You know, that was, I'm sending a packet every second and then all of a sudden we, you know, threw a ton at Bak Peng and then I stopped sending and then I sent a ton. Um, I can see the delay in packets round trip you know, from one, se one millisecond to 749 milliseconds. Um, and so we can obviously see all of this in the client logs. Um, so that's how we would troubleshoot on RDP. So we'll look at it on VBSS. Does anybody think it's gonna be better? So this right here should convince you guys to make sure your clients are VBSS capable. So things you'll notice, mostly in sync, right? Tons better, and you can't really tell, but it's a little blurry in a video-based screen sharing when there's packet loss on the network. Now, if you absolutely need to see what's being shown, um, and you're gonna exasperate a problem, right? I have a 10% loss on my network. I could request control, and it's gonna fall back to RDP. Now, no, you're gonna get the issues we saw on the previous slide where there was that nice 10 to 20 second lag. Um, I could also start up recording, so if we wanted to um, invoke that fallback. So video-based screen sharing is client dependent on a peer-to-peer -peer conversation. So I have to be using the 2016 client with Bok Tang using the 2016 client. Now if you're using 2015, 2010 communicator, please don't, um, it's not gonna be able to do VBSS, so it's gonna be RDP. Um, we had a Surface Hub issue um, with VBSS, but that's been fixed. So any downward client or backward compatible client will force a meeting down. We do require a cumulative update on the server side to be deployed to implement VBSS in a conference because all of that's going through the MCU. The MCU is redistributing the feed, so it needs to be VBSS capable. So same things um, we talked about on the previous slide. You know, I can look at the packet loss on a good network versus bad network. Um, good reference, one of the things, anybody here gone to their network team and said, I had a video issue, video quality issue, and the network guy says, ah, must be a network issue? Nope. So our job, in my opinion, as link professionals, is to give enough evidence to the network folks to show that there's a network issue, right? You know, you walk in and you say, huh, I don't know how a network works, but why are we dropping 25% of packets, right? You're not telling them, hey, your network's bad or your baby's ugly. You're just saying, I notice <laughs> I sent Bok Tang 100 packets and only 80 got there. Some of them got lost. They didn't know how to ask for directions, et cetera. Um, so a lot of what we're able to produce is that information to show the customer or show the network team what's going on. Um, so here what we're showing is um, TCP port is the red. So what we're doing is I was using uh, video-based screen sharing. I fell back to RDP, and you can see the different consumption on bandwidth. Um, I believe it was something, let me see, I wrote this in the notes. Um, yeah, so you can see the bandwidth moves from 1.6 megabits per second to 3.2. Um, so obviously net less network consumption on your network makes who happy? The network guy, right? The who says it's never a network issue. So how do I know what is being used in a call, whether it's VBSS or RDP? So this line right here highlighted, M equals application sharing, M stands for media. So media equals application sharing, I can see what's being used versus RDP or TCP. Um, anybody got questions on VBSS? Everybody's gonna go back, make sure clients are upgraded. So VBSS is a great improvement in the client. It was driven from you guys. Folks said, you know, and I'll, I'll say a dirty word, so maybe he'll mute me. WebEx starts faster. 
that's where VBSS came from. You know, WebEx works over, you know, this firewall. WebEx, so this was us addressing those concerns. So offline messaging. Um, one of the favorite features on offline messaging, um, or one of my favorite features on the client is offline messaging. Um, and it's, did anybody read the first bullet point? Okay. Is there a server dependency on offline messaging? No. So I will tell you, there was a numpty who wrote the TechNet article on offline messaging, and I put in the TechNet article, dependent upon server cumulative update three. I was wrong. My bad, sorry. Um, so there is no server side dependency. I caught it, unfortunately, a month later. So tons of folks had already seen the article. So um, humbling myself and saying, you know, my bad. That was my fault. Um, so offline messaging relies on exchange integration. Any banking folks in here? So you may have conversation history disabled. Yep, so sorry. Everybody but her is going to love offline messaging. So we are dependent upon IM auto archiving. Um, so if you're in a banking, pharmaceutical, anything you know, regulated, HIPAA, you're not going to be able to leverage it. And the reason is the architecture. So anybody know what the history spooler folder is? OK, that means you didn't have an exchange issue with link. So when we write conversation history, the client writes to what's called the history spooler folder on your desktop. And then we basically take it, you know, Microsoft's really weird, we take it every 50 seconds and move it up to Exchange. Not 60, not 40, 50. But we move that up to Exchange for your conversation history. Which is why if you save your conversation history, you don't necessarily see it immediately. There's a 50 second interval. You could see it a second later, you could see it 50 seconds later, depending upon where you're at in that timer. So, Offline IM works relatively the same way. We write it to the history spooler folder, it's basically a mail message. Every 50 seconds, we drop that into Exchange Web Services. Exchange sees it and says, oh, this isn't a conversation history message, it's a mail message. Let me go ahead and send it. So we'll talk about that flow. Um, so here's real world. Um, you know, Voktang tries to send me an IM right now. I'm hopefully not logged in on my phone. And he gets a SIP message back that says the user can't be reached. The client says, cool, let me drop this in the history spooler folder and go send it off um, to Exchange. So what could go wrong with that, right? There's a ton of components out here. Um, primarily when offline IM doesn't work, it's Exchange Web Services. Um, so we'll look at what we can see in the snooper log. So remember, SIP is for signaling. This is Voktang sending me an IM. Um, and we'll see back there a status code of 480, which says JSON's unavailable. This tells the client, hey, go create this message and then send it to Exchange. Anybody know how I would troubleshoot that connection to Exchange? HTTPS traffic, Fiddler. I can watch that client drop the message in the Exchange infrastructure through Fiddler. Um, so anything web traffic, we can do with Fiddler. So for the banking gal in the back, this is how we could determine if uh, client, if archiving's enabled for the user. Here I'm checking the global policy, but I would also probably want to check the end users. One of my favorite features in the Skype for Business slash link client is the control right click on the icon in the sys tray where I can see configuration information. Ton of troubleshooting information in there. You know, one of the things I was talking to somebody about yesterday is, if you overcomplicate things, you make it harder to use and harder to troubleshoot, right? So we have this configuration information in the client. You, any help desk person can see this, right? And they can see, you know, EWS information, status is okay. Now, if I say, can't connect to Exchange, offline IM is never gonna work, right? We'll never see the Fiddler message go out. We'll never see that traffic. Um, I've watched people troubleshoot an offline IM issue they had network captures going, they had Fiddler going, you know, they had all this stuff. They were running logging on the Exchange server. And I'm like, client can't connect to Exchange. It's not gonna work, right? So, you, you know, keep it simple. I left the other S off there. So PSTN calling and PSTN conferencing. Um, so PSTN calling is not yet available in Australia and New Zealand. 
Um, I think the question came up yesterday of when it's coming. I will say this as Vakteng gives me a look. By the end of the year, we will have the preview program. So do the math. This year. What? This year. this year, end of this year. I'm not in sales. Um, so we'll have it available. Um, do the math, we're in October, so it's very, very soonish. So PSTN conferencing is already available. Um, this slide is probably a little dated since I wrote it a couple weeks ago. Um, it's available now in U US, UK, and Puerto Rico. So one of the things that makes PSTN calling and PSTN conferencing in the cloud interesting is, you know, Joe Admin over here can't go run logging on the front end servers and the edge servers, right? Because those are in my infrastructure. You guys don't have access. So we expose some of that stuff to you and I'll show you that here in a few slides. So one of the things that's interesting is, um, and this was a hard lesson for me to figure out, you know, I travel a ton, not a ton international, but I do do international travel and dial plans are different. You know, last night I was trying to place a call and Vak Tang's like, you know, that's not the New Zealand country code. And I'm like, yes it is. And you know, I'm dialing the London country, or England country code. And the number didn't work. Um, so dial plans are based on each country. So in 0365, you set a country you're homed in. So, you know, mine's in the US, somebody else is UK. That dial plan is based on the country. You can see the dial plans using, I think it's get CS dial plan through remote PowerShell. So you can see those. Um, I worked with a customer on an issue, um, one of the most embarrassing cases I've ever worked, where they gave me the logs, I couldn't figure it out, did a desktop share, couldn't figure it out, got a dev involved, they couldn't figure it out, we got the dev manager, then we went to the principal dev, and she was having dialing issues. Only user I've ever met that dials the plus sign. <coughs> right, so when we do the plus sign, we ignore the dial plan. So I was like, dial plans are broken, the client's broken, the service is broken, but this user was like plus five, five, one, two, three, four, you know, and then she wasn't getting the Brazil country code. Users without an enterprise voice um, SKU is the term we use, but a plan in Skype for Business Online also have a dial plan. So this is for, you know, dial out during a meeting, things like that. So when we troubleshoot calling, and this is the same for an on-premise issue, there's two scenarios that we have. One is, it just didn't work, right? I tried to call Vakteng, the call failed. I called the guy in the back of the room who just came in and said, hey dude, everybody in the room wants pizza, right? And we're talking, we're talking, and the call dropped. You know, so that's a, a call or mid-call failure. The other one, which has a ton of issues on it, is call quality, and that's probably where we spend most of our time troubleshooting. You know, so if you have call establishment issues consistently or intermittently, typically, where do we look first? Firewall, right? So it's media traffic, something's coming in the middle. Um, nine times out of 10, you're running something like Checkpoint that's doing SIP intrusion detection, and you know, Checkpoint says, oh, Microsoft's not following the RFC the way we expect it, that's probably a SIP intrusion, I'm gonna kill the call. So I worked with a customer, um, was it jail? And so I got called on a crit sit. So I went to the jail and I'm like, cool, you know, this will be fun. So I go in, I go through security, get patted down and all those other unmentionable things. And I get in and the warden says, okay, we can't call 911. Anytime we call 911, the call gets dropped. I'm like, all right, cool. Well, let me go back to my car and, you know, get a phone and this. And he's like, you're not leaving until this is fixed. <laughs> I was like, ha ha ha. And he's like, that's the one thing we're good at is keeping people in here, so. Um, <laughs> I fixed it so quick because it was not the nicest jail. Um, that was uh, another checkpoint firewall issue. So if you're using checkpoint, call me. <laughs> I can tell you usually where it is. So call 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 quality. Um, the AV guy's gonna love me. That's the you know I'm on a call and then hey da 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 hey da 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 right. So nine times out of ten it's network. Um, my favorite call quality issue. This girl, we got her a brand new Plantronics headset, super nice, right? It was like, I think the savvy, you know, like $200, $300 headset, and she sounded like she was in a wind tunnel. And I'm like, all right, move the mic closer to your face. No change in the audio, right? All these things, we went through it, put another, another device on her desktop, doesn't work, no changes. Come to find out the default audio device was set as her webcam. <laughs> so anybody had that? So we are making some new enhancements to online, which will help you find those users. 
you guys are probably familiar with Event Zero. They're an Australian-based company. Um, we acquired some of their technology. We're rolling that into the PSP on, on or um, Skype for Business Online call quality dashboard. So that's coming very, very, very soon. <laughs> Echo, delay, distortion, um, one-way audio. Again, nine times out of 10, these are either firewall or networking challenges. Um, so we can look at this and we see the common causes, right? One of the things that you should get to the point of is, and I do this now and I, I'm sorry because it's gonna stick to you guys after I tell you this. When you're on a conference call and you hear a call quality issue, figure out what it is in your head really quick and be, oh my God, there was echo, you know, that's gotta be a device or the client or this. Oh, you know, there's broken up audio, it's definitely network, right? You know, Jason's watching Netflix. Um, service. We provide a service for PSP and calling. Your on-premises servers provide that service too. If the service is down, obviously we're gonna be um, having all of these issues or any of these potential issues. So investigating configuration of an online user, we use a commandlet through remote PowerShell um, called get CS online user. Um, you can see the output here. So, um, you know, we piped it out so you can see all the values. I can see this, the plan ID, you know, what SKU they have, do they have the capability plan? So MCOEV is Microsoft Communications Online. Um, one of the things that's funny, anybody know the name of the archiving database? LCS log. When will we learn not to name things version dependent, right? So we have LCS log, we have stuff that says um, the commandlet get CS. Anybody know why it's CS? Communication server, right? Marketing and engineering, two different groups, right? We're like, aha, it's gonna be called communication server. We'll name every commandlet this. And they said, cool, we're calling it link. I'm like, crud, you know? And they're like, oh, just do a find and replace. I'm like, mm, maybe not. Um, so some of these things you'll see are legacy names, you know, LCS log, OCS, CS, um, all things dependent. What do we do at Microsoft? We rename the product every two releases. So I don't know if we'll do that anymore, but um, that's the running joke, right? So every two major releases, it becomes a new name, LCS, OCS, Link, Skype for business. So maybe we'll call it something new just to mess with you guys. So I was super nice to my buddy Ricardo. I obfuscated his home phone number here. Um, we didn't do that at Atlanta, so I fixed that. So please don't call Ricardo. Um, you know, so I can see the number assigned to a user. That's hugely important because then I can go search in the PSTN usage details, which is a new online report we added, and I can see everything about that call. It's essentially the equivalent of looking at um, the CDR or the call detail records. So I threw this screen cap in horrible resolution. We just released this commandlet about two days ago, so I apologize, I got somebody to email it to me. So it's called get CS user sessions. So one of the things that happens with monitoring reports is you try to drill down and find that call, right? You know, you're digging through monitoring reports. Well, with this, I can actually see everything that was sent in that VQ report to the online service. Um, we will probably roll this to on-prem eventually Obviously things take time, but um, super cool commandlet, you know, so. Can you guys see it at all? It's get-cs user session. So I put it in the recording so you guys can see it. Um, so investigating SIP messages. Um, so this is um, typically we're troubleshooting something around call quality issues, or sorry. I didn't put my phone on silent, I'm the worst. Um, so we're investigating issues with connectivity, right? So the call is being disconnected. What we look for in a disconnected scenario is the buy message. Something said buy. So the buy message is basically tear down the call, right? An invite is let's instantiate or an invite somebody to a call, the buy is turning it down. So I can see this buy came from the infrastructure, you know, BL 20R, 00 Med, 04, Microsoft, great naming conventions on our servers. Um, I'm used to working when I had my own infrastructure, I always named things like after actors or you know Star Wars characters or planes, but not us, we gotta have really complicated, so. So we can see in the buy message a line starting with the MS diagnostic and that contains information on why the call was finished. So this call leg has been replaced. You know, maybe it was a transfer or um, something like that. 
I can also look up the MS diagnostics codes um, and I can see exactly why the client believes the call was terminated. Um, remember I talked about ICE, so ICE done turn. Um, we have ICE warning messages, you know, you can Google those or Bing them if you happen to use Bing. You know what Bing stands for, right? Because it's not Google? No, I'm kidding. <laughs> I have the craziest 11 year old daughter. She has the best jokes ever, so. Um, so she picks on me, but I've got her using Bing now, so. Something about her allowance being tied to it. <laughs> so remember I talked about the VQ report. This is where we get all the call quality information. So hugely readable information in this bottom left box, right? Heck no. So you can use any XML parser to um, look at this. I am a huge fan of a tool called Sublime. It's free, you could pay for it. You know, it's like WinZip. Anybody ever here paid for WinZip? Yeah, I still don't know how that works. Um, so I can see the packet loss, the um, loss rate on the network. So this is, hopefully not confidential, but this is our PSTN conferencing infrastructure at Microsoft. So we don't run the same code you run on-prem, which can make it confusing. So um, one of the things you know customers always say is, Jason, I can do this on-prem, but I can't do it online. I'm like, yeah, well, it's probably different in what we're doing. So this infrastructure, we have what we call a PSTN resource forest and a user forest. And what this means, and this is important to know because we, we fixed something with this, and, and I wanna bring this up. Any, who was the conferencing users? I think there was two besides Octane. Okay, maybe now one, so. I don't know what happened. Did you guys just unsubscribe from the service? No. Um, so we had this issue, and my one PSTN conferencing customer in here, if you had it, I'm gonna say the odds are so funny. I did this in Ignite, 600 people in the room, and there was like three customers. So if you've had it, I'm gonna cry. We'd run into a scenario where I join a meeting, Skype for Business client. Vakteng joins from the PSTN on his cell phone. And Vakteng can talk to all the PSTN users on this side of the room, and I can talk to all the VoIP users, and nobody could hear each other. Crazy, huh? So we call that a barbelling. We join these two infrastructures together, and we occasionally have what's known as a barbelling failure. Ever had it? Hundred percent, you know, hundred percent failure. Well, good news is we fixed that. So we had static conference IDs in the online world, and the way that caused havoc is. Anybody know how to end a meeting? <laughs> yes, finally. So we tell every uh, meeting organizer when you're done with a meeting, end the meeting. I'm probably pretty sure Vak Tang is the only one in here that knows how to do that. Um, I've taught that to customers. End the meeting when you're done. No clue how to do it. So on the very bottom of the client, there's these ellipses when you're in the meeting, the little three dots. You click that, there's a little end meeting option. Nobody ever does it. It's probably the least clicked button ever. That played havoc with the online infrastructure where we would join or barbell these meetings. People didn't end the meetings. You would have meeting overlap. You'd have PSTN users in the meeting that stayed in the meeting because they put their cell phone on mute and they went out and played with the kids while there was you know, a big conference call going on. Nobody in here has ever done that, right? And then what do you do when they're asking for you? you? You come back like 10 seconds late, you're like, sorry, I couldn't find the mute button. Uh-huh. So we fixed that, we enabled dynamic conference IDs in online, we're rolling that out to all 80 million tenants. I think it's done. Last count, we were probably halfway and that was like two weeks ago. So you shouldn't have that issue anymore. Um, I gave away a device, I don't have any with me, but at Ignite Atlanta, I asked, what would you call this failure of these two things to join together. This guy up front says, unfortunate. <laughs> like, well, barbelling was what I was looking for, but here's your headset, so. So any mo mobile users, anybody got mobile phones, right? Ever worked a mobile issue where you're looking at the mobility logs and you're like, huh, what's all this? So we totally changed everything on you guys, right? We're SIP based, right? And you know the SIP signaling and how all this works. Our mobile clients aren't SIP based. Anybody know what they work on? It's something called UCWA, so Unified Communications Web API. Oops. Unified Communications Web API and UCMP, Unified, Communica Unified Communications Management Platform. So two web-based protocols. 
all of the logic, all the signaling, all of that happens on the server side. So everything is web traffic to the servers. Media excluded, right? So we do all the signaling over web, or HTTPS. So that's why the mobile clients go through reverse proxy. The Mac client is based on UCMP and UC WASP. So what that means is the Mac client does not do SIP. So we totally confused everything, right? All our clients use SIP except for the Mac clients. It's kind of fitting, right? Mac users are a little bit different, a little odd, so why not? No, so um, what that allowed us to do was we took the link for Mac client, which, you know, elephant in the room was, was horrible, right? Wasn't a great product. It was good because it was the only option, right? And we threw all that away. We started brand new about a year ago in Stockholm, started a new Swift project and said, let's take all the mobility stuff from iOS and put it in the Mac client. So we took these guys in Stockholm, legacy Skype. They wrote the Skype for Mac client. They wrote the iOS client. They wrote all this stuff. They're Mac users, right? I would meet with this guy, Klaus, one of the devs, and I would say, hey, on Windows, and he would say, I don't care, <laughs> right? Because he's writing a product for Mac users. So if you've used it, my Mac guys back there that have seen it, it looks like a Mac product, which is super cool. Yeah, there's themes, there's consistencies on colors and icons, but it's written for the Mac. By product of how we're based on mobility, if you've supported iOS or Android or Windows Phone, you can support the Mac client and vice versa. So um, on the Mac client, which is now gonna be niche to the three users in here, so I'll go through this slide fast. Um, this is where we contain the logs. So let's role play really quick. I'm gonna call the CEO of my company and say, hey dude, fire up your Mac, go to Finder, go to your user directory, CEOs probably hung up, right? Horrible experience. So what do we do? We have the one IT guy that supports the CEO that we then say, hey, go get the CEO's laptop, drill down, find these logs. He supports every application. He's like, dude, this is way too complicated. So that was me working with Mac users. And so I got something super cool in the Mac client. If you go into the Mac client, you go into preferences, there's a button called collect logs. Oh. CEO, go to your preferences, press the collect logs button. Anybody CEO can do that one? Super cool. Creates a zip file right in the downloads folder. All the logs are bundled up. Nothing else to walk the user through. You guys are not as excited about that as. Let's try that one again. So the collect logs button, it's super cool, right? <laughs> Yay! Man, tough crowd. I'm gonna, all right, I'll tell my computer joke now, my computer crash joke. Um, so sfbmac.log is where the logs are. We roll the logs just like the UCAPI logs. Um, so that's the worst is when somebody says, hey, I had an issue, so I restarted the client. Mm, now the logs are gone. Well, the old client, the old log will be there as well. These two, the age trace, um, this is where we store media information. So again, super useful file. So what did Microsoft do? We encrypted it. You guys can't decode it, so no. Um, those two you won't be able to read. There's nothing really usable. We have to push it through a server to parse it. It doesn't give a ton of end user information. So I'll go through this slide quick since there's not a ton of Mac users in here. But this is the typical logging scenario I would do to troubleshoot a Mac issue. I would say, you know, open terminal, here, clear all the logs in the cache files. Um, we'll see how honest everybody is in here. Anybody lazy? Yes. So I'm super lazy. I don't want a 700 meg log file from here. I know I'm so mean. I want the very, very smallest log file. So I clear the clash, clear the logs. I want the user to reproduce the issue and only that, right? Don't send me a log file for the whole day and say, yeah, I had a call at 10 that had this, but then I did three more calls, right? It's horrible. So clear the cache, delete all the saved log files, clear DNS, flush DNS, close the client, start new, and collect log files. Um, so this is a perfect scenario. I don't know many companies where you can call the CEO and say, hey, fire up terminal and do all this and give me a clean set of logs. It's a perfect scenario if you can do this. Um, one of the things we did is we're cleaning this up and I created a script file, so a Mac um, scripting file that will close the client, do all this stuff, restart the client. It's gonna eventually end up on skypeoperationsframework.com, so please visit that website. Tons of information out there. 
um, after I run all of this, I end up with um, you know four files that I'm really looking for. I get the network capture, I can grab the logs, I can grab media information, and I can grab the system logs. Systems log is good. Um, on our Mac, we get this, what we call the be uh, spinning wheel, pinwheel. So I call it the beach ball of death because you know we have the blue screen of death. So the app, Apple users are like, no, it's a beach ball. So. so one of the cool things you can do with Fiddler is set it up as a proxy. And what that is hugely beneficial to is Voktang's a Mac user on my network. I can have his client route through my desktop, the web request, and capture it through Fiddler. Where is that important? The CEO, right? You're not gonna go up to him and say, hey, go install Charles on your device. And when it pops up the certificate prompt that says, do not trust this, click trust, right? You know, we know that from Fiddler where it says, do not trust this. Okay, trust. Um, so what we can do is we can install Fiddler um, or we can use Charles. Um, and basically we set up a proxy. I point to Voktang's client to my PC as a proxy and all of his web requests are gonna route through my PC. Very important. I'm not saying I've done this. Notice that was so it wasn't on the recording. Remember to take the end user's machine off of yours and stop routing web requests through it because you'll be like, what is going on here? So read all Skype for Business logs, server, desktop, mobility, Mac. There's a new build of this coming. Snooper is your best friend. Um, this is the build or higher that you need to have to be able to read those logs. Um, I'll make it even simpler because I can't remember 7.0.1168.1. If it doesn't work, upgrade. So again, Snooper is one of your best friends for troubleshooting. Um, and I'll pick up the pace, I got the, the look, so. So we have the messages tab as well as the traces tab. I kind of jump between both. Remember, I'm using a couple different tools at the same time. Um, this right here is super slick, um, and I do have a screenshot of it. We wrote parsers for Sublime. Anybody ever hear, use Sublime in here? I bet you there'll be like one more hand after this, maybe two. So Sublime is a free text editor, and we wrote a parser for it that gives you color coding of the messages. So you can literally fire it up, open the log, and get color coded mobility logs or Mac logs inside of Sublime. Sublime works on Windows and PC. So if you're a text analysis tool person, you can go out and write your own filters. So, so you can download Sublime text editor, um, and then I put an AKA MS link up there. Obviously unsupported, it's not a product we release, it's just for you to be able to read those logs. Um, so you'll basically copy those into the directory, selection, format, Skype for Business log, and you get super simple color coding format of logs. Everything from the link connectivity analyzers using UCMP and UCWA, you could open those logs with it, you can open iOS, you can open Android, you can open Mac, just can't open regular logs. to the minute. All right, so feedback is hugely important, right? So this conference is based upon feedback from you guys. Session feedback is what helps the, the organizers create new sessions or refine sessions. Um, super cool, you do the survey, you're gonna win a Surface Hub, or sorry, Surface Hub. <laughs> 22 grand, <laughs> we'll give one of those away. So you're gonna win a um, Surface Pro 4 or a Xbox One S. If you win the Xbox One S, there is one caveat, you have to give it to me. Because my son needs a new Xbox. Um, so please fill out your sur survey results. Um, it's hugely important. Any questions? Video-based screen sharing, yes. So we'll fall back to RDP. So the question was, I'll save the mic guy. No, I'm good. I'm hugely loud, everybody can hear me. Um, so the question was, if I'm using Skype for Business Online and I have a downwards level client, so not 2016, will VBSS work? And the answer is no, unfortunately. Um, I don't believe we have plans to backport VBSS to 2015, which is the mantra you hear in support. What do we always tell you? 
are you on the latest installation, right? You know, hey, go upgrade all 24 of your servers really quick for me. Um, no, seriously, we, we want you on the latest builds. A lot of what we're innovating in the client, especially, we do in click to run. Um, the MSI client is frozen. It's a, it's a build that we created 14 months ago, I think, and it's been sitting on the licensing site. Um, everybody know the difference between MSI and click to run? If you're not on click to run, please talk to your account team and say, hey, why should I be on click to run? And if they don't say you should be, tell them to call Rock Ping. No, I think tell them to call me. But we want you on click to run for things like Skype meeting broadcast, features get added to the client. Those only go on click to run. Um, security stuff goes in MSIs. So, but yeah, you're gonna have to upgrade your user. Which is not a bad thing to upgrade the client sans the fact that you sometimes have to retrain users. You know, the clients work with backwards level servers, so anybody running 2013 server? 2010? Yeah, so you have the ability to use older clients. I think it's an M minus two strategy we have with clients, so. Other questions? All right, can I tell my PC joke? For the three people that were in here this morning, an hour early, don't tell anybody. Why did the PC crash? Bad driver. My 11 year old daughter's best joke ever. <laughs> Gonna be right in the survey. Jason's not funny. <laughs> I think I am. Nobody else does. Um, any other questions? Troubleshooting issues? Kudos on the Mac client. Collect logs button. We just send that away. I am. So this came up at Atlanta. Uh, I am pushing to try to get that in the Windows client. I think that would be beneficial. So. Everybody loves telling a user, hey, go to, and I'm gonna screw it up because I can't remember it, percent user profile, percent app data, percent da da da, link 16, tracing, come on. Yeah, yes sir. The Mac client, is that, do we have an official release date yet? For the what? For the Mac client. Are we recorded? Wait, wait, hang on. Okay, go ahead. No, I wanted the recording off. <laughs> um, very, very, very soon, like hugely soon. What's today? Wednesday? Yeah, still, it, it, so our goal is to release this month. Tentative. Um, today's Wednesday, right? Okay. It's very soon. <laughs> From what I've heard. Um, I'm friends with one of the Mac devs on Facebook and he posted, hey dude, I'm leaving because we're releasing this date. And I'm like, oh, you can't post that on Facebook. <laughs> so don't go add me as a friend, I deleted it. Um, but yeah, it, it is extremely soon. So I can talk to you offline if you have some serious concerns on the dates or you know planning and things like that. It's Wednesday, right? <laughs> Here, I'm just saying, it's not Wednesday in the States yet. but I don't know when it releases. <laughs> um, any other questions? So I'll, I'll hang around here afterwards if you guys have questions. Um, I will throw this out there, which I'll probably regret if all 100 of you do this, but if you have a case that's stalled or something you're working with support and you're not making traction, drop me an email. Uh, my email is jasco, J-A-S-C-O, at microsoft.com. Um, if I knew Vak Pang's email address, I would have given you that. But um, so drop me an email. I, I can look at it. You know, I've got a small 25-hour flight coming up tomorrow, so I'll have some time. All right. Thanks, everybody. Please fill out the surveys.